Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Brandon Sharpie, and I'm the Executive Director of the International Association for Conflict Management. And I thank you for joining us in this webinar-based session titled Data Fraud and What to Do Next. Uh, this is obviously a critical and timely session to bring to the table. And we thank our panelists in this conversation, Yuri Simonson and Maurice Schweitzer, for providing ISM this opportunity to host this discussion. A brief background on our discussions. Yuri is a behavioral science professor at Asade Business School in Barcelona and co-director of Wharton's Credibility Lab. He also co-hosts the academic blog, Data Colada, which can be found at datacolada.org. Maurice is the Cecilia Ken Yu, uh, Yen Ku, professor of operations, information, decisions, and management at the Wharton School and University of Pennsylvania. He has published articles on trust, negotiations, and emotions, and I'm proud to say that Maurice is a past president and fellow of IICM, and for that, we thank him for his long-standing contributions and dedication to the association. So as mentioned, uh, this is being run as a webinar format, given its size. If you do have any questions along the way, please post them in the Q&A box. We will get to as many as we can within our scheduled uh, time frame for the session. I do apologize in advance for any questions that we're unable to tend to. So with that, I'm going to hand the session over to Maurice and Yuri. Great. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Brandon, for supporting us, setting us up. Thanks, Cindy, um, for supporting this, this, this webinar. Um, my thinking was to sort of take this moment and, and, and help us make sense of where we are um, and where we can go next and how we should be thinking about what's happening in our field. So I was really delighted that Yuri and I could have this conversation and um, Yuri being uh, both an expert in the credibility lab and, and Yuri and I both being um, co-authors of Francesca Gino's. So, so I have a series of questions and I'm sort of like ask questions, we'll have sort of a conversation, but also through the sort of the Q&A, we'll, we'll try to get to some of the questions also that uh, emerge for us. But, but Yuri, you know, let me ask this to sort of start us off, like, 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 give us a sense of where we are, sort of given the posts of Data Colada and, and Harvard's investigation. So, you know, what do we know? So what do we know, like, instead of what happened here? So, yeah, like, basically, we had, um, we were, like, a, a short version of what happened. We were approached by junior people who have chosen to remain anonymous two years ago. Um, they share with us some analysis. We thought they were troubling. Um, we worked on them together for a while, and then we shared our concerns with Harvard. And then Harvard followed procedure and for a long period of time, something like 18 months, because it took a while to get the process started. Looked over, we actually had almost no communication. So almost everything they did, we have no idea. We haven't seen the final report. We don't know really what they have done beyond what others have told us. So people have told us, oh yeah, they interviewed me a year ago, but we didn't know that. And we do know that at the end of the process, they decided to initiate um, a retraction of those four articles, which are the, the only four articles we flagged are the four articles that they initiated the retraction for. And that, and we don't really know, we are, we're making a leap of inference here that Francesca Gino went on leave at the same time for causal reasons, but. Actually, we nobody has told that that's actually the reason she she's on leave, and we don't really know what that means anyway. And if you read the and with this, I will finish this next question. If you read the retraction notice, especially the psych science ones, the JPSP one is not yet published. The two psych science ones are very unusually concrete and descriptive. And because usually re retraction notices read like the authors have lost faith in the data or cannot reconcile something, but this one's are basically very, very similar to what we proposed in our blog. So it was these observations were moved uh, and in a way that favored the hypothesis of the paper. And what they did is they, based on the retraction of this, they compared the data used to produce the results. So picture the data she shared with, a, with somebody who requested the data or the data they uploaded to the OSF with her research records, which is not clear what that entails exactly, but it's an earlier version based on Harvard's testing or description, rather. It's an earlier version of that same file. Or that. And that's what we are in terms of the, the, the facts. Um, we are also moving forward with an initiative with all the, I don't know if this is the right time to talk about that, Maurice. So we, sure, sure, sure. So, so we also have, so six of us, including Maurice and I and, and four other 
co-authors of Genome Study, and, and, we, and we reach out to people today, reach out to all co-authors of, of Francesca. And the idea is to create a centralized database where each of us speaks about the origin of the data for each of our papers. So we can focus our energy on studies that are clean of suspicion, or at least as clean as any other. The, the, somebody said this to me, and I like that framing. They're as credible as any other paper published in the same issue of the same journal, right? We're not saying they're perfect. We're not saying there's no p-hacking or confounds or, or mistakes. We're saying we have no reason to expect them to be any better or worse than any other paper in that, in that issue. And, and then to see the extent that they could be uh, concept that for the for which which papers are effective, which ones are not, the people who will most benefit from this are junior people where Francesca may have played a secondary role in the paper, maybe not in being involved at all in data collection. Those people are in the market or they're going out for tenure. And they want to as quickly as possible dissipate that on their body of work, which is reduced just because they're young. And, and so to limit to limit the, the implications of that. So I think that that would be my answer to your question. Yeah. 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 Well, great. It, and you mentioned p hacking in this comment. Mm -hmm. Where would you draw the line between p hacking and fraud? Yeah, it's, it's interesting. So I draw lines a few ways. They're kind of, they're kind of very practical ways instead of like a, some high minded theoretical way. But one is hopefully it will resonate with those who are with me. One is could a, could a reasonable person believe what they're doing is right? Okay. And so one way to oper operationalize our question is, will you tell your co-authors, hey, you know, I ended up dropping the control condition because it seemed like people just, our, our scenario was just too confusing for them. And I think a lot of reasonable people would do that. Or you say, you know, I dropped those, mm -hmm. even though we didn't pre-register that we would drop people who were inattentive, they seem really inattentive and the effect gets so much stronger. We're gonna drop those people. I think a reasonable person could do that, so that's be happy. But then if you would not tell your co-author, you know, I'm just gonna move eight people from one condition to the other and not tell our readers about it. Like you would not tell your co-author that. So that, so something you would tell your co-author, it's p hacking. Something you would keep from your co-author is fraud. That's one way. Another way to think about it is like the false positive rate. Like how likely is your analysis to work? So if you p hack a little bit, you may go from 5% of false positives, maybe to 8% We in our false positive paper. What we thought was not unreasonable was to get all the way to 60%, although nowadays probably that's it's lower than that. But with fraud, you have a hundred percent. Right. So like if I if if I'm allowed to move people around until I get an effect, every single study I run will work. And that's that's another way of thinking about the distinction. But I I find the first one more more compelling in that, like will you tell your co-author that you do this? Well well, I actually, yeah. So like like that's actually closely related to another question I had is like, how do you think we should be thinking about Francesca Gino's co-authors, recognizing that both you and I are, you know, in that set of, I think it's 151 people. Yeah, something like that. Um, so I think of, I guess it's weird if I'm, if I'm one of them, right? Uh, but I think of, I think of co-authors as primarily as victims, right? So they, there's a, and no, so I want to, I want to draw a distinction. No, nobody has unambiguously claimed that this was Francesca Gino's doing. So the retractions don't say that, they just say data she had and data she posted. Uh, my belief is that she did it, but there's no evidence. But, but it doesn't really matter because maybe let's say somebody else did it in her computer somehow. And you as a co-author are equally victimized by that person. So primarily, you are a victim of that person. Your reputation, your time and effort. Um, I, I've been talking to some people who were who were RAs, actually in a, in a different in a different uh, for, from a different case, and they just looking back on when they were very young and working in these projects, and they spent their summer collecting data, working, and somebody sort of stealing their labor uh, for their benefit because they were doing they were volunteering their time or, or their instead of keep having a lucrative summer job, a non-lucrative one, because they are interested in truth and social science and so on. And somebody's taking that away from you. So that's one way to think of them. The other one is as evidence, especially with 150 of them, evidence that this is not just like usually we talk about like a few bad apples that commit fraud, and implicitly that those few bad apples are surrounded by sort of a few mindless apples that don't notice the fraud. But when you have 150 mindless apples, 150 people who don't notice that there's something off, 
it's really not the apples, right? There's something about this system. Like we don't have a, we don't have good enough protection against this. And if, if 150 people can collaborate in this way and not notice it for so long, to me, I think of the authors as an existing proof that we need to change how we go about documenting findings in social science so that this becomes less likely to happen. You cannot fully eliminate fraud, but you should be able to eliminate 12 years of fraud going undetected. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So so I was thinking, so you know, there's something there's something to me that's striking about sort of the the breadth and length of this. And I was going to ask you, you know, you've been involved in other cases of fraud. And I wonder, you know, what you think of as the same or different about this case, and maybe the scale and timeline is is one feature, but but I wonder, like, like as you reflect on other cases of fraud, are there sort of general lessons? And then what's what's different about where we are? Yeah, so there's some things that are similar, and they tend to be more. I guess every case is to some extent every case is different, but there are some similarities. So, for example, some things that are a red flag is like a senior author coming with data that's ready to a junior author. Typically, it's the opposite. Typically, the senior author <laughs> abuses the junior author and gets co-ownership of something. They are too busy to really deserve full credit for it. And when that flips, that's like a red flag that's been present in a few cases. That's one thing. Another, another thing that's common to fraud, and that's a, I guess it's related to the fraud versus p hacking question. With p hacking, you get barely significant effects like those that just barely cut it with fraud because there are no constraints, right? Like if, you, if I'm moving rows around, there's nothing to constrain the effect size. You can get gigantic effect sizes. And you see that in these four papers, you see it in other papers that Francesca has covered. And you see it in previous cases of fraud. In fact, um, there's, there's, a, there's not many, there's let's say 20 people in social science that have pursued like fraud cases. In almost all of the first, like the first red flag they see is a very big effect. And so that's, that's a commonality to almost all fraud. Um, and in terms of the differences is, it's not common to have somebody of, 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 of Francesca's success be involved in this. So like I was involved in Smithers case, probably most people who are listening have never heard of Smithers. They probably many haven't even heard, although I think it's a great school, but they probably haven't heard of the school he, he used to work at. He was not prominent. Uh, he was an AE for JCR. So it's, you know, it's in journal of consumer research. So he, he wasn't nobody, but he wasn't, you know, the editor of the HEP. He wasn't working at HBS. And I, I did a tabulation of, so Stapel, I think, who was uh, in 2012, I believe, caught as a fraudster. He, he used to work at Tilburg. He so far is a, the most prolific fraudster in social science. Uh, we don't know, we don't know how many papers actually of his were false, and we don't know how many paper Francesca's are. But if you, if you just look at, it, at the, how prolific they are, uh, Francesca's more prolific than was uh, But again, with a big, huge caveat, in fact, part of the effort is to not put everything in the same bucket. Like I, right. I believe a lot, of, a lot of her co-author work is legitimate. But just to give a scale of who's the person involved, it's like arguably the most influential person involved in academic is a in social science that we know about. Um, and and do you think there's something unique about our field and social science when it comes to fraud, or or do you think that other areas like drug trials or economics are equally susceptible, or is there or or do we just need different regulations in place to make us more like other fields? Yeah, I think there's nothing special about us. Uh, I, I think what's special about us is that it happens to be the case that those twenty people. I mean, if you're the kind of person, and if you think about it, a lot of them are JDM, judgment decision making related. It's kind of similar, like catching fraud in a data set. It's not that different from thinking about how people make judgments and, and, and how they process information. So, so it's kind of close to a wheelhouse. Well, if you if you deal with depression or if you think about like the inflation rate, that's very different from looking at a spreadsheet and looking for fraud. So, so I think it's about where we have our the light. The light is in our field. So we find the fraud here. 
but in, and in fact, like the record of most retraction by a single scientist is, is in anesthesiology. That's the record holder, like hundred and some articles. And I'm very confident there are fraud cases in economics that just have, have not been pursued. So I don't think there's anything special about us. So you think we're just better at catching it? I think so. Um, I've been asked by colleagues uh, whether or not they should continue doing research in topics like behavioral ethics that Francesca Gina was studying. And I'm just like curious to hear, I mean, I have, I have my own view, but like, you know, what do you think? Uh, how, how would you respond to those people? It seems to me like, I mean, quite first, what I would ask them, <laughs> you know, as a good Jew, I would ask them about that question, but I would ask them like, are you really interested? And if you're interested, of course, I mean, if anything, there's there's more room for finding new things, right? So for, you could rediscover the things that were claimed, but you could just take a complete different path. Like the field took a path to study dishonesty. And it's, a, it's actually kind of an idiosyncratic path. Like, why are we studying this incidental impacts? And why are we looking at the relation with creativity or whatever it is? Like if you were studying from scratch with dishonesty, what questions would you ask? And you have some freedom to do that because no, people are no longer, it's no longer easier to just do like an incremental on the, on the existing literature. So it seems to me like it would be a great, a great thing to say. Yeah. I mean, I, I share that belief. I mean, I, I think these topics we're now seeing is less investigated than we have thought. Um, okay. So, so let me, let me talk, think about like, like short term and longer term things we could do next. And you mentioned already some ideas, um, but but let me sort of talk, talk about the short term. So, so Francesca Gino has co-authored many papers, a lot of co-authors, and they include papers where she collected some, all, or none of the data. And, and we're trying to catalog that now, but how do you think we should be thinking about this, this body of work? I don't have a very clear view. So it's evolving, so it's a little too fresh. Um, I can tell you like two extremes that I don't like. So it's somewhere in between, okay? One extreme would be if Francesca Gino is an author, we should discount it. That's one extreme. The other extreme is if you don't have raw data, you've analyzed and demonstrated fraud, you should trust it. That's the other extreme. I don't like either of those extremes. I don't like that extreme because we, should, we shouldn't treat data that comes from from a computer, let's put it that way. We shouldn't trust that it comes from a computer that has produced four fake findings with the same level of trust as from a computer that's never produced a fake finding. Now, in between, then it, it gets tricky. Some people believe, some people I, I like and respect, some people believe that if, if you have a single study that's fraudulent in a paper, then out of principle, you should retract that paper. Some people believe that. I would make a more case-by-case -case judgment, my personal view. That's actually reflected. It, that, it's actually an odd thing to recommend people to read. I recommend reading that Psych Science Attraction. There's a lot there. And one thing is there is that the editor, uh, Patricia Bauer, is saying the, art, the, the, the study that was fabricated was key to the paper. And that, that to me, that's my current thinking, but it may evolve. My current thinking is I want to do some sort of counterfactual thinking. If this study had never existed, would the paper have sort of been published? And it's of course an impossible thing to be perfect, but we, we, why should we try to be perfect? We should try to be good enough. And so if you have seven studies and six were fabricated, probably the paper should be retracted. If you have two and one is fabricated, probably should be retracted. If you have seven and one of them is fabricated, and actually if one of them, you cannot tell whether it's fabricated, then I think it's the author's decision discuss with the editor if they ask me i would probably say well unless this is like the key finding maybe not now the the pnas paper that with study three was a current student study that then are really coordinated execution on and study one and two were data that uh, francesca collected the paper was retracted when only study three was proven fraudulent. so that's that's a case where and i know the authors it took me a while to reach this agreement that's, I would say that was the right call because if you have two lab studies and one field study that is just delicious, right? Like if you're, if you're teaching MBAs about this, you have to tell them what the current insurance study. Then the P, it's hard to imagine PNAS publishes just the two lab experiments. So retraction seems easy. 
Now, I'm, I'm giving you the easy cases. I'm sure among the hundred some articles, there are going to be some difficult ones. That's my take. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, I, I think that makes sense. Um, but this is sort of a difficult decision a lot of co-author teams are now wrestling with. Um, let me let me sort of you know take a step back and, and you already alluded to this that is if if over decades we're not able to detect fraud what what do you think is a field we should do differently and and, and let me sort of start off by asking a question about trust like like are we too trusting in the field yeah so it's tricky this view I have, I have I've heard for longer because it came even when we were talking about e-hacking and pre-registration and some people back in 2012 were pushing back against it because they, they perceived it. Like they're asking somebody to tell us if they show up a condition or asking people to tell us how they set sample sites. They saw that as a violation of trust. Like we're all part of a community. This is especially true in smaller fields. Like I believe consumer behavior has this, has this to me it's a problem that it, the smaller fields, people feel like they're part of a community. And that's great. <laughs> the only part that's problematic that I'm alluding to is there's a sense that asking people whether they did those things, it's a, it's a lack of trust. But I don't see it that way. Because I think if I just ask you something and I believe your answer, I'm trusting you. And in fact, what I'm doing is I'm just trying to be explicit about what it is that I'm trusting. And what we have now, we don't really have trust. It's actually close to carelessness, right? Than to trust. It's like, so I trust you, Maurice. I trust you. And so you, we work on a project together and you bring a data set. And if I don't ask any questions, I'm not just trusting you as a, as a person that wouldn't do anything wrong with the data. And in a way, trusting, but it's not even the term because we haven't discussed it. Like, okay, who collected the data? Supposed to hire an array, okay? But the array in turn supervised undergrads to collect the data. And one of the undergrads actually had a party. And so I, they asked their roommate to collect the data. Right? So when I trust you, if I don't ask you to describe what it is that you did, I'm really trusting that undergrad roommate. And that's careless, right? So placing trust on people that you don't even know who the people are, that's carelessness. Now, if you tell me, look, I got it from the array. Here's the data. Here's when I collected it. And I don't double check everything. I just take you at your word. Then I'm trusting. So I think, well, so I believe in trust, and I think actually it's not workable. We cannot work without trust. It's just too expensive, and it's prohibitive, and it would be unpleasant also to be doubted all the time. But I think we have to move to a place where we, we know what it is that we're trusting by people making explicit statements about, here's what I did. You don't need to prove it. You don't need to record yourself doing everything, but you need to indicate what that is. And so, so actually, maybe I'll have something else, but I'll maybe get to it later. So I don't want to steer yeah. too much. No, 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 no. Let's let's say, let's let's go there now. So okay. Yeah. So so what I have in mind. So I don't think I don't think detection is a is scalable um, as a way to prevent fraud. So we don't need a grant that will hire twenty data colliders to go out there and do an audit. That's not. It's not going to happen. It's going to be problematic. It's terrible. It's a terrible job. Like, I hate it. And it's very error prone in terms of like, you need overwhelming evidence to find something. So it's very hard to do it. And then for us, if we just get a little better, uh, they won't post Excel files anymore, or CSV files. So I think the only way forward is prevention. And so that ties to trust. What I see as the only reasonable solution to fraud is to do what we do when, when people go to conferences and they tell us that they bought a burrito. Right? Like, when you go to Warden and you want to get your, your $8 back for that burrito, you don't just tell the administrator, hey, I ate a burrito. You show them a receipt. Now, they don't go and check that their restaurant exists and that you didn't pick it up from the trash. So they trust you, but they want you to be explicit about what it is that you did. So you tell them, I bought this thing for $8, then they pay you. They trust you. You wouldn't say that your administrator does not trust you or your department that distrusts you. So I think we should do it for our research. We should be providing receipts for who was the array? When was the study run? If it was run at the computer lab of the, let's say the Wharton computer lab, what was the study number from the, the computer lab? If you, if you had an IRB, what was the IRB number? It may sound onerous. I, I think if you have the right interface, you can add 10 minutes to data keeping. 
And if you do that, if I think of all the cases of fraud that we've been in, involved in detecting, and many of them have not gone public, all of them would have been almost impossible to pull off if they if the if the researcher had to show receipts. Why? Because the the faker is so the first person they're lying to is their co-authors. That's the first person they're lying to. And so if they have to show a receipt, that's already it, it, it already is going to raise a red flag that it's going to make it. I, I, I think if you have to show receipts for all your studies, I don't think you can do it. You can pull it off for 12 years. I don't think you can with 150 people. You just don't get to pull it off. And it's trust because you're not documenting yeah. to an insane level, right? Well, it's interesting. I, I was thinking, I was talking with a, 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 a colleague actually just last night. We are talking about Madoff and sort of this record and some reason finance and it actually met met Madoff. And, um, and, and, and the record keeping was actually a key idea there too. I mean, and one of the things that you mentioned, they said, so like, like in all these fraud investigations that you've had, how often have you seen co-authors working together in fraud? Um, never, I've never seen it. And I've never heard of a case where it's happened. So it is this idea of, so as co-authors, when you we can sort of start there with record keeping among co-authors, I was thinking about replications and there's been this shift toward replication. How, you know, how are you, how do you see replication in building credibility in our field and you know, where does that fit in? So I, I have a somewhat idiosyncratic view on replication compared to most people who are like in the open science movement in general. And even compared to my two closest collaborators, Leif and Joe, I have different views from them on replications. Um, but I think we will all agree that they don't play a large role in terms of fraud. So I think we all agree on that. that Something failing to replicate does not involve fraud. Something succeeding to replicate, at least from a significant, not significant perspective, doesn't involve fraud. Just because you're willing to fake data, it doesn't mean you're unable to come up with true ideas, right? Like they're not necessarily related. So I, I think replication is good. I think we, we've done too little of it historically. Um, I personally, this is where, I, where Joe and Leif would give a different answer than, than I would. Uh, Leif Nelson and Joe Simmons. I'm not, I think replication should be part of the pipeline of most research projects instead of standalone projects. Um, like I, I'm seldom drawn to read a paper that replicates another paper. I, 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 I'm usually not drawn to that for a few reasons, right? But, but, but what I think should make, and if this is true, I think in other sciences, if you're building on somebody's work, study one should be. We're going to replicate Schweitzer and Sons, study one. Now, study two, we build on. And, and they would just be, and maybe that's the one you're describing, just a couple of paragraphs. And so that to me makes sense. Now, what if those fail, the question how do you communicate that? That's, that's included. Maybe you will go back to the world where those should be more publishable. But so many people wasted years trying to get effects that either here or in other cases just really weren't there. And I've, you hear the stories all over. I mean, I'm sure you've heard them too. Like somebody, they try for a year and then they said, Let, let's just run, let's just run the original. See, like they try to build on it. Like, okay, what if right. we what right. if we make it with incentives and they don't get any? And then after a year, they run it without anything and they don't get the original. So I my view of replication, that should be step one. When you know, sometimes with a field experiment, you cannot do that. Um, but in general, it's a, it's a, it's a, something that's approachable. And, and also you will just learn about the, if, if the finding is replicable, you will learn a lot about it by running it yourself and building it better. Well, well, actually, so you mentioned this already, this idea of um, having field data. So how do you think, like when people have field data, it's sometimes hard to share those field data sets or people work yes. so long to collect the field data, mm -hmm. they're, they're not as eager to turn it all over all at once. What, what's your thinking around field data? Yeah, for data posting, the, for posting field data, I don't have great solutions. I share the concerns people have that, well, if you cannot share it, like how do we, how, do, how can we check your work? 
but I, I see the other side, look, I just can't share. Like it's either I don't share it or I, or I won't publish it, but I cannot give you the data this company gave me. Um, so, I, so I think some people have, there's some people more on the tech side of things working on how can you share synthetic versions of the data or how can you run the data remotely? I haven't really been too involved with those uh, initiatives and some of them, they seem interesting, but I, I cannot really say very much about them. But the part about receipts, that seems very easy to do. So the, the, it, it seems easy to you say, look, I went to this, you know, to, there's a bookstore chain here in Barcelona. Um, maybe it's bigger, it's called Reread. They sell used books. We've also run a few experiments with them. And so I would tell, look, I, I, met, I met with like Nuria Rodriguez and we, we had this meeting and she shared the data with me. And I just write that down. Now suppose, suppose Nuria is uncomfortable. She doesn't want me to say that Reread was running experiments uh, with the side. Then you can imagine that we'd say, okay, we, we're not gonna publicly, but our statement is, the author shared with the editor the name of the company and the name of the contact person. And that's in it. Like what you want is, you wanna make it hard for two, for, for 12 years, make up like Staple did schools where he was supposed to be running studies and there's just no way to do it. Right? Interesting. Uh, I, yeah, I like I like that idea that sort of gets us somewhere in the middle. There, there are a number of questions here in the Q and A, and I'm going to sort of you know pull some of these. One question here is: Can you speak to similarities and differences in the Ariely versus Gino cases of fraud? So the the Ariely case is weaker in a few ways. Like it's it's a one-off data set where it is plausible that the data wasn't even in his computer, but it was somebody else's. It's plausible. I don't think it's the most likely explanation, but just the evidence, like if you think about reasonable doubt, I think a good lawyer can get to reasonable doubt in that case. And in the Francesca case, maybe even reasonable doubt that she did it, but that somebody with access to her computer did it. That seems very hard. And so just the level of evidence, it's overwhelming in one case and, and sort of borderline in the other case. I don't know if that, I mean, it's not your question. So I don't know if no, that's no, your no, question, but it depends on the yeah, audience member uh, question there. Yeah. Um, th here's another question. Is there a way to broadly reduce the motivations to commit fraud? So can we normalize publications of studies that are well-designed but show no results? Um, and then the, this question goes on to say, you know, if so, who's positioned to initiate these structural changes. Yeah, so here, here's another place where I have a, a very different view from many people in the open science movement. But in this one, Leif Nelson and Joe Simmons argue with me, um, which is we don't think incentives are the problem. Um, I, I, have, I, have a, I have a blog post about this, I have an old blog post from 2014 or 2016 or something, writing about this. And like if, if you want to mess with the incentives, and this is it's a bit of a joke, but it's real. Like what you need is more faculty meetings. Like if you basically if you make if you make the life of a professor very aversive, people are gonna stop cheating to get it, to get that lifestyle, right? But if, but if you pay people to just think and spend their time whichever way they want and they get a good salary, especially in the business school, that's the incentive. Uh, the froster, the froster is not looking for the JPSP, the froster is looking for the lifestyle of a successful academic so i don't think and also like and if that's what you want if I, I want a really high salary with low effort and prestige if the field was to somehow magically and i don't think this is possible but magically care about a no finding as much as a real finding as much about a sexy finding as a completely boring finding then the fakers would just fake boring studies <laughs> like there's nothing intrinsic about i mean accounting fraud i'm sure is not sexy but it's very profitable and so uh, so to me, that's not the problem. Yeah, interesting. And maybe this is related. There's another question here. Uh, what do you think the consequences should be, I guess, to Francesca? The, the money aside, Francesca influenced so many careers, tenure decisions. People's careers have been impacted. Um, do you think since... So I guess that's the first question is like, you know, what do you think the consequences should be? I don't know. I don't really think I have a privileged perspective to speak to that. Um, because it's mostly, 
like our sense of fairness, our sense of what problem should seek legal remedy, what problem should seek uh, like shame, what problem should seek compassion. That's more of a personal, it's more of a personal thing. So yeah. I have my views, I have my views, but I wouldn't say they're like informed by my expertise. They're just my, my personal morality views. Yeah, I I agree with that. I mean, that is, I, I think a lot of us are walking around with ideas, but it's it's hard to to look to even precedent for mm -hmm. this sort of thing. I, I should say, it, like, I feel incredible sympathy for, especially the youngest researchers who, some people who may leave academia may, may not pursue their, their dream career right. because they were at the wrong time with the, and they interact with the wrong person that it's that seems terrible just like i think we underappreciate that impact um, uh, i mean i'll tell you you're, i mean i find it incredibly demotivating like you know like what what's you know why am i spending all this time doing this if you know i might be working with somebody that's just it all turns to sand but junior people i've talked to have said you know i've thought about leaving academia like but it's so crazy yeah There's, i mean there, there are some college students out there who are thinking should i go get a phd in behavioral science and this is telling them don't do it yeah and and that's terrible it's terrible because my like my biggest motivation is like i want behavioral science to inform policy and 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 lead to a better life, so to speak. And, and to do that, you need talented people who find true findings they can share. And this is really, is, there's a story, steroids analogy that they can be, but that's a very career focused analogy. This is more like a, like a parasite that kills the host. Uh, it's a really just horrible outcome that we, we really have to work hard to get rid of. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've seen sort of casting doubt even on, Danny Kahneman, like it's it's. Um, let me let me switch this this question about uh, teaching. So Nina Strominger has a question. Um, what about those of us who teach behavioral ethics? Should we remove the Gino and perhaps Ariely papers from our syllabi? So I would say so. This this initiative that I was alluding at the beginning, the many co-authors one. One of the so, Right, so where we're going to have conceptually, there's there's going to be a website that's going to go live in September. Right now, only the authors have access to it, and it's going to have every paper. It's going to tell you for each paper how many of the studies were the data collected by Francesca Gino versus not. And so, if you if your syllabus has a paper that has no data from her, it's easy, like no reason to take it out. Uh, in fact, it's a great excuse to add content to your class and discuss this very issue. Now, for the other ones, we, we kind of go back to the conversation about when to retract and what to do about it. Um, I think for a class, it's a little easier. So even if a paper has seven studies and six are false, and you want like, proven false, but study three is real, like maybe you cannot justify not retracting the article, but you can certainly justify teaching study three. So it seems like for teaching, it's, a, it's you can even allow yourself to give a more leeway to cherry pick the evidence that you believe to be justified in terms of being something you believe is correct. Um, Joe Simmons has a question uh, saying, we knew that Gina was faking data back in 2014 after simply reading one of her papers. It was so obviously false and fraud was the only plausible explanation. Um, so, so he's asking, don't co-authors and editors have responsibility to engage in some self-reflection here? Aren't they enablers? Yeah, <laughs> it's great because I don't I don't get to talk to Joe very often, so it's great to do it through this medium. <laughs> but I understand, right? Because it's it's a, it's a great discussion to have. I'm not criticizing them, but I think my view would be: yes, it is it is a time to for self-reflection, but that goes back to 150 rotten rotten apples. I think what it tells us that we in general are not calibrated with what to expect. Because that one possibility would be, yeah, if if the 150 people all suspected fraud and all kept collaborating, no problem, then man, that's really bad sort of from a moral standpoint. But if the 150 people were clueless, then 
it's not a moral problem. It's it's more which, and I I believe it's way closer to the latter. That we just and this is kind of embarrassing as a as a field. We're just not calibrated with the truth because we don't calibrate with what the truth is. So what the truth looks like, what our truth finding looks like, and and this is the place where even though I made that clear demarcation between fraud and behind early on, and they're very different from a moral standpoint, but in terms of leading to people who work in a field to not know what's a reasonable finding, what's not a reasonable finding, they're connected in a way. In that you keep finding subtle manipulations having sizable effects. And that leads you to think, well, I guess, I guess she's just very good at finding those subtle manipulations. So I suspect if, if we were able to get in people's heads, surely there were some people who were suspicious. You can't imagine it was, it was very few, very few of us. But I think many people were well, I guess she's just very good at doing these things. And that's, that is something that should change. It's not obvious to me how that changes, which is we need a better calibration of what can we expect from a manipulation? What, what kind of manipulations can plausibly impact? I mean, there are some papers where you don't even need to get to the results section. When you know what the manipulation is and what the dependent variable is, you should already know there's no way you can do move this thing and impact that thing. That's, if that's hard, like if you write us as a reviewer, you will be overruled for being prejudicious. prejudicious. But, and I, and I, I think that, I think, I'm, I think I'm, I'm representing Joe's perspective here, which I share. The question is, how do you get people to realize that a coin D of 0.8 for a mindset is not gonna happen? Like you're not gonna get that. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know how to get there. I don't, I don't know how to get there, and, but I do realize that's, so that's not a moral sort of reflection. It's like an empirical calibration reflection. Like, how can we, how can we be, hundred years into this project of the of social science and not be calibrated as experts with what to expect? That's that that's really bad that we are there, and I agree that we're there. I don't know how to get out of that. It's interesting. I mean, I I think back. You know, you mentioned JDM, and I remember when I was starting off in my career, thinking that there was so much pushback from economists who were thinking about loss aversion, just like trying to convince people that loss aversion is real mm -hmm. um, or, you know, base rate neglect is like, like, like to think about um, like, or like, like just like the risk shift, like, like, like people were like, like, like people or the, the endowment effect, like we worked so hard at some very basic results. Mm -hmm. And I felt, I feel like we were trying to sort of, Prove it over and over and over that you know you know the loss aversion really happens. Um, yeah, and so, so, so and then we somehow switched. I mean, like like switched to like, well, I guess you know, once we finally convinced people, then we did go to like, oh, uh, you know, and I think I, th I think Joe's a point here that it's you know sort of very small effects. Having very big, very, very very small sort of manipulations having very large effects. Yeah. So this ties back. <laughs> it sort of affirms a previous answer I gave, and it contradicts another. So it kind of affirms the answer of we should start projects with applications. I think that's probably one way. If we start doing that, we're going to learn the hard way that those huge effects with this stream manipulation they just never happen at least in our lab. And so you you just naturally go to skepticism. But the other one that I'm contradicting is like about the incentives. So I, I the one thing that I, I do wish journals were more, so I don't think a lot of null findings should be that easy to, to publish because a lot of time null findings are uninteresting. But I think very similar replications, they should be like, if they say, well, we already know this with like baseball players, why do I care if you show with like piano players? Like show me something new. And I think we should grow tolerance for, and not tolerance, actually interest in finding in our top journal. I, I want to read in JPS three papers that study basically the same question, but in a slightly different setting with a different study context. That probably would help with this as well. Uh, right. Um, there are you know, sort of dozens of other questions, but um, you know, Yuri, is there any? Any sort of like last closing thought that you have at this point? I mean, I 
I see this as part of a broader conversation and I see this as, mm -hmm. you know, not the, this isn't the, the final word. I, my thing was just to sort of begin to help people try to make sense of yeah. where we are and what we should go do, do going forward. So embarrassingly, I did not think ahead of this to this question, but so what I, well, um, what I believe, I, I'm a usually optimistic person. And I think in a way it's embarrassing how few protections we had against fraud and how easy it has been to fool us. And going back to Joe's question, how it, it is embarrassing that we're not calibrated with effect size. At the same time, it tells us there's there's gotta be a lot of low hanging fruit. Like, it's not like we've been working on this for 100 years and still people are getting away with it. It's more like we've left our door open for 100 years. Maybe we just close the door and that will reduce burglaries. And, and so I think that's where we are. And so we could make substantial improvements with minimal cost to our quality of life, so to speak, in terms of having a, having fun, enjoying our conferences and reading, reading fun papers from others, but not leaving the doors completely unlocked. I think there's room for that. That's, I think that's the uh, light zone. Yeah, or let me or just, so like 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 your record keeping idea. Let me sort of like like switch to a slightly different analogy. Um, that yeah, we don't need to leave the keys in the car, right? You know, right. Uh, you still get to drive and go everywhere, but, <laughs> but you just right. take the keys you with take, you. Take the keys out, yeah. Take the keys with you. That's right. I mean, so it could be that in ten years we say, oh, we did all those easy solutions, and we're still catching people left and right. So we need something more, but we haven't really. We have done nothing to prevent it, nothing. And so yeah, I mean, it's just, yeah, I mean, it is, it is strike. I mean, cause like, I think, you know, part of it is like, like in my mindset, it didn't, like, I, it didn't occur, like, like, like people might change mm -hmm. values and it like I was, um, all right, well, Yuri, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, thanks thank for, you. for taking this time. Um, thanks to all of you who sent in questions and th thanks to being part of this conversation. Uh, Brandon, again, thanks for, for, for hosting us. Yeah. Thank you, Maurice and Yuri. Hopefully uh, this shed a little bit more light, gave some more food for thought. Um, it's obviously a topic that's not going to go away anytime soon. And uh, as was discussed in the Q and a session and then in the session in general, pretty wide spectrum of stakeholders that need to, that need to address this. So I want to thank everybody for attending this session and taking the time out of their, of their day. Um, this will be posted on our IACM YouTube page uh, as soon as we are able to edit it and clean it up a bit. Um, but uh, beyond that, last bit I have is a save the date notice for IACM 2024 in Singapore, June 23rd through 26th. So uh, I do hope to see you there. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, thank thanks. You, Ryan.